It's my privilege now to invite our preacher this morning, the Reverend Canon Dr. John Sinyoni, forward. Uh, John is also the Vice Chancellor of Uganda Christian University. And I think you probably heard about this in the announcements at the beginning of the service, um, but it's just a great privilege to have you with us. Thank and you. if you would preach the word, brother. Amen. Amen. Uh, let us pray as we are. Dear loving Father, thank you for this morning. It's a beautiful day, beautiful time when we come into your presence. For we know that there is fullness, fullness of joy in your presence. And like we just read in the psalm, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of ungodliness. Grant that even now we may be able to see the fullness of who you are. And that Jesus would be revealed to us afresh to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and to serve you more diligently. Help me to decrease that only you will increase, that you will speak to me and speak through me. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please do sit. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, let me say thank you once again to, uh, for the wonderful welcome that I have received, uh, especially on this Sunday when my own wife, whose name is Ruth, is not here. Uh, so, uh, like I always say, when I don't have Ruth, I'm ruthless. <laughs> so... Uh, but I know she will be back this evening. She's actually in the country, uh, but she traveled to Alabama and will be returning this evening. Uh, so it's a joy for me to be welcomed even without her. I want to say, I mean, we've been married with Ruth now coming to 35 years. The Lord has did bless us with four children, two of them married. We have four grandchildren. And uh, any grandparents in this place? Ah, so, you know, when I look at grandparents, I'm looking at crazy people. <laughs> um, you know, grandparents and grandchildren, that's the craziest thing God has ever created, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. So, uh, I'm glad to be part of you. So, we have four grandchildren, and uh, we are very delighted to, meet, to be with them each time they are with us. But I also bring greetings from Uganda Christian University. As you heard, uh, you have been our friends, our partners, and we are so glad for your support. Uh, I think since I was here uh, the last time, we have established the medical school. I don't think it was established then. So we do have a medical school for, the, for Uganda Christian University, and that is based at a hospital, the very first hospital in Uganda founded by the church, and uh, we already have two cohorts that we have admitted. Please continue to keep us in prayer. Medical schools are very, very costly, I'm sure you know that, but uh, God has taken us for the last two years, and we've been able to see amazing, amazing things happen, even with that medical school God has provided thus far. I should say that uh, for both years that we have admitted, we've had an overwhelming number of applicants. Last year alone, we had more than 800 applying to enter the medical school, and we could only take 60. Six, zero, that's all uh, that we could take. Among those who applied, we had a pharmacist who is already qualified. We had a veterinary doctor also already qualified. But these are people who are desirous of entering the medical school, and we just couldn't take all of them. We really focused more on the younger people. So this, is, this just shows you the hunger and the need. And uh, when you look, on the other hand, at the need on the ground for medical doctors, it's amazing. I mean, it's just, uh, I know we do need many doctors, but we also need Christian doctors that will go out into the hospitals and serve the Lord. So thank you very much for your partnership. Greetings from UCU, uh, from our five campuses of more than 11,000 students. And uh, 
we rejoice in the ministry that we are doing. The other faculty that was founded during uh, these, these last two years is the Faculty of Journalism, Media, and Communication. That's another one that is always oversubscribed in terms of applicants, and we can only take so many. So continue praying with us, and I'm sure the Lord uh, will see Uganda Christian University rise higher. Now this morning we are looking at uh, the presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ by his parents. <coughs> As I was reflecting on the message for this morning, my mind and my memories went back to our traditions as a people in the area I come from called Buganda. And in that area, we have our own ways of presenting the child and even ensuring that the child who is presented truly belongs to the family. When a child is born, at least traditionally, now we no longer do that, they would take a piece of the umbilical cord that's cut away and it would be put in a bowl of water. If it sunk, the child would not be a child of that family, so they believed. But if it floated, then all was okay. Of course, they would first dry it and all that. You know, that's the way they presented. And after assuring themselves that the child indeed belongs to us, then they would move on to give the name. And our names themselves are very unique. Many people ask me, what does Senyonyi mean? It actually doesn't have any straightforward meaning. Because Senyonyi simply tells me and anybody who hears the name that I belong to a certain clan. And so anybody, and we have 52 clans, and in each of those clans, the names are different. And it's not one name per clan. It's actually a set of names. So, for example, in my family, we were born 13 children for our two parents. And each of those children had a different name. Those are clan names. But, you know, that's how they would receive a child who has been born and now is being presented for to be received in the clan. Something similar also happened, but a little different, when it was twins. When the moment you have twins, you actually rise in status in our culture. Your title changes. You are no longer called Mr. If you're a man, you are called Salongo. If you're the mother, is called Narongo. And the children themselves are given very special names. Uh, depending on the ranking, whether they came number one or number two. <laughs> and uh, then immediately after that, if there is a child who was born before the twins, that child's name also changes. And uh, the name of the child that follows the twins, so it really just changes everything around the family. But one of the functions that is carried out for twins to receive them in the family would literally translate into English, into the, wo into the word hatch, that you hatch the twins. <laughs> That's how it translates. But it's a very special function, and there are rituals that would be carried out in that family to ensure that the child has been received and the child is now a member of the family. And of course, when we talk about the family, for us, the family is not as important as the clan. So we are, that's why we are named after the clan. We are not named after the family. So of course now some of those things have changed, but that's not the way we would. But it's a very special moment to be able to receive the child because of the value that is attached to the children. And if a child in growing up somehow goes astray, becomes prodigal, wild or whatever, there are also rituals that are used to receive back that kind of child. So you can see that the whole idea of presentation was not unique to the Jews. When I read the story about Joseph and Mary presenting the Lord Jesus Christ, 
They were doing something that three times we are told it was according to the law of Moses. So there was a ceremony. There was a ritual. There was something that was done. And we do read in verse 21 that the very first thing that was done was the circumcision. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, now notice, it was after he had been circumcised. Then he was named Jesus. That's exactly what we do. So for me, I relate to this actually very closely. Just realizing that it's after the circumcision. And then, of course, the mother Mary, at the, after 40 days, is also purified. And that is provided for in Leviticus. And that's not all. There is, of course, a sacrifice, as we see, that is brought that they did bring some pigeons that were presented as part of of the rituals for purification. Now what was going on here? Jesus was being presented, as it were, to be consecrated to God. Listen, he was the firstborn. And the firstborn, of course, belonged to the Lord. And so Jesus, in going through all these rituals, was himself being consecrated to God to be used of God, to be his. Uh, but at the same time, Jesus was being received among the covenant people of God. The Jews. So, but we need to look at Jesus also at, at a different level. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is not simply received for consecration to God as any other child. There was something special about him. And I want to mention three major things that we get out of this text. The very first thing that we must look at to understand how Jesus is different from any other is his identity. That this was, not, this was a child like no other. Just like the twins make the family different, in this case, Jesus himself, as the one that opened the womb, also was very different from just any other child. But as if that were not enough, the way he was named. There are different titles that are used about Jesus. One of them is Jesus indeed, as it is in Matthew chapter 1. And we are told that the name Jesus, which is another rendering of the name Joshua, actually means he will save his people from their sins. And this is not just for the sake of naming, because you can be named Joshua, but you never save anyone. But Jesus is named because he's going to carry out a function, the function of saving his people from their sins. And so we are told that this, this child, is the Savior. Simeon himself recognizes that in verse 30. He says, For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you are prepared in the presence of all peoples. That the very opportunity that Simeon had to look at Jesus, he was looking at the salvation of God. He was looking at the Savior who would save his people from their sins. So that's the first name that is given. But we know that he's also called in Acts chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, the cornerstone, the stone of stumbling. Now that is an interesting term. Because when you call someone the, the stone of stumbling, that's not the kind of desirable thing you would expect. But that is exactly the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. Every name had significance. It's actually telling us that Jesus, wherever he will be named, will divide people. That there will be those that will be called his, and there will be those that will not be called his. Yes, I was born in a family, and I grew up going to church. But it was not until 1976, as a university student, that I became his. I had been baptized as a child. But really, this had never become my life. And 1976, I invited Christ into my heart. 
And that's what made all the difference. Jesus, the cornerstone, the stumbling, the stone of stumbling. He divides people between those that are his and those that are not his. And as if that were not enough, he's also the one that divides between those that are saved and those that stand under judgment. It is between those that have enjoyed the fullness of the salvation of God and those that, have not, that are under the judgment of God. I often think about the term, the phrase that we use in the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. We pray, thy kingdom come. Now the implications of that is that when his kingdom comes, when Jesus returns, there will be those that will be saved, there will be those that will be for judgment. And that is all because Jesus is the cornerstone, the stone of stumbling. He's also called the Messiah. The Christ, the hope that the Jews waited for, that looked that they looked forward to. So as he's presented in the sanctuary here, he's also presented as the one in whom the Jews had been hoping and waiting. And he's presented to us the hope of Israel's redemption. And finally. He's called the Son of God. And I'm not saying that I'm mentioning all the names of Jesus. I just picked out these four for our illustration to understand that Jesus is indeed unique. His identity is very special. So we are told he's the Son of God. In Luke chapter 1 verse 32, when the announcement is made, this is the Son of God. He will be the Son of the Most High. This child, is God with us, Matthew tells us. This child is divine. God presents himself to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. The identity of Christ, who he is, makes all the difference about the present. It wouldn't present any other baby. But to present the Lord Jesus Christ is to present one who is different, who is unique, who is from God, indeed who is God himself. The second point that's made for us in this text is the universality of the Christ child. That this child had not only come for the Jews, he had come for everybody. Listen to what Simeon says. I'll read from verse 29 to 32. He says, Lord, now you are letting your servant <laughs> depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people. Now listen, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. That you had prepared it in the presence of all the people, a light for revelation, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. That's why I'm saved, my brothers. Because I know that this savior is not a savior just for Jews. I don't think I have any DNA strand, a strain that shows <laughs> that came from Israel. But this one thing I know, that in Jesus Christ, I belong. And everybody belongs. Because he's not just the savior of Israel. He's not just the savior of the Jews. He's not even just the savior of us who are in church. He's the savior of each and everyone, Jews, Gentiles, whatever we may be. He's the Jews of all. He's the savior of all. That is the Messiah that we are talking about here. So he says he's a light of revelation also to the Gentiles. Those people that had been kept out all this time, now they can come in. Why? Because Jesus has been presented to them. That is the presentation of Jesus. And for me, it's exciting just to reflect on that, that the God of Israel, that they had already seen as the God of Israel, is not just the God of Israel, but he's the God of all. And if he's the God of all, then his salvation cannot be the God of some. 
is going to be the God of all. The universality of the Christ, the Christ child. No wonder Peter, when he stood in the Sanhedrin, and he was addressing the Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, he actually makes a statement, and there is no salvation in anyone else. No one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Only the name of Jesus. So when we proclaim Christ, we don't have to proclaim him apologetically. We don't proclaim him compromising as if there is another. I have heard people preach as if Jesus is an option. He's not an option. God has one option. And that option is called Jesus, the Savior. So when he's presented to us, we need to be mindful that there is only Jesus for salvation or no salvation whatsoever. That's what we are being told in the presentation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. I'll hasten to my third point. And my third point is now, when we understand who he is, when we understand that he is universal, so what? What does that actually mean for us as a church? It means that we have a mission. We have a mission. The presentation of this child is the mission of the church to the world. It was Joseph and Mary presenting the first time. But now it is the church. Over the centuries we have done it and we must never cease until the Lord comes back that the responsibility lies with us as a church. We are a missional church. There is no other way that we can do it. The church must always be reaching out. When I'm at Uganda Christian University and there it's education, higher education, even higher education as mission. When people come to my office, and I've seen people come to my office and they don't know Christ. When they come to my office and I get to know they don't know him, it's my opportunity to present this Jesus to them. And I've seen people come to Christ and I cannot cease, I cannot stop doing it. Because the fact that Jesus is who he is, the fact that Jesus is universal, his salvation is for all people, it does not matter. They may be Muslims, they may be whatever. Indeed, at Uganda Christian University, we do admit Muslim students, and we've seen them come to Christ. That is our mission. How will they know otherwise? If Simeon says he's a light of revelation, to the Gentiles, it is the church that must take him as a light. So when we are preparing medical doctors, or we are preparing journalists, or we are preparing lawyers, or we are preparing engineers at the university, or whatever else we may be preparing them for, we are preparing them to go out and present Jesus out there in the world unapologetically. The message of Christ is universal. Just a few things as I conclude. Because Paul himself understood this very well. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I just want to make some quick reference there. Maybe let me read those first five verses only. And then I'll share a few thoughts for you and shut up. <laughs> and Paul says, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Now what is Jesus? 
What is Paul saying here? He understood who Jesus is. He understood the universality of Jesus' work, his salvation. And now he says, all this has implication for me. And that implication is to present Jesus and him alone crucified. I don't preach my opinions. I don't preach my own intelligence. I may have it. I don't preach my education. I don't preach anything else. I present Jesus because he alone is the Savior. The faith that we hold and the faith of our hearers must stand on the power of God, not on the changeable wisdom of man. It must stand in the power of God. Our wisdom is foolishness. As he's, he argues in the very first chapter of 1 Corinthians, it's just foolishness. But the wisdom of God is difficult even for us to fully understand it. And people inquire when we preach the gospel, they, when we preach it out of our own wisdom and they try to use their own wisdom, they cannot understand it. But it's God's wisdom that opens their minds. Ours is to proclaim in the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God that he gives and in his own wisdom. We present Jesus and Jesus alone and him crucified so that whoever knows the crucified Savior finds salvation. Whoever comes to the Lord Jesus Christ decreases and let Jesus be glorified and increase. That really is what matters for us. Let our foundation, the foundation of our faith, not be in our own wisdom, not be in the things that we think to be right. Let it be in the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the unshakable and unchanging truth in which we must stand. Jesus has been presented to us today. Therefore, we go out to present him to the world, wherever we may be found, maybe in our places of work, maybe in our homes. It may be as we move around, wherever our instructions, may the people around us see that Jesus is presented. The question must come to all of us. Will Jesus be heard? Will Jesus be seen? Will Jesus be witnessed? Will Jesus be known in and through 